what if you never get the pro card, but who do you become along the way of approaching it? And that is such a, a powerful thing that I find bodybuilding doesn't get credit for in that in the same way powerlifting doesn't Mm -hmm. get credit for, but in the pursuit of something so big and so focused and narrowed down and isolated, what you learn about yourself along the way, who you become along the way, how is that in and of itself not a success? It's not a reward. If you do it for the right reasons, the, the pro card almost becomes a secondary or tertiary goal. It might not even be the primary focus, but what you've learned along the way is you've, you've built delayed gratification. You have a system of nutrition and health. You have a system of training physically for the rest of your life. You've understood the necess- necessity of relationships and social circles, building the right circles around you that support you. You now know what it's like to give everything to a single cause. You can go do that with now anything in life. You can take that to business, to study, to your career, to your relationships. It's something in all the sports that I've played back home in Australia, bodybuilding is the one thing that is that I've really learned could do that for me. And I almost guarantee it'd be the same way for powerlifters. It's it's something that, yeah, you you didn't get the pro card. It's unfortunate. Perhaps you just didn't have the genetics for it. There is a component where genetics adds up, yeah. where your ability to tolerate supplementation adds up. So worst case scenario, you don't get it. But the byproduct of being an athlete like that you are a better person objectively. Well, I believe that is, I believe that to be empirically true for one reason. Mm -hmm. And the one reason is anybody that has, you know, a big goal like Mm -hmm. that, then they actually achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. That goal is fleeting, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Their their satisfaction from that goal doesn't last very long, right? Mm -hmm. And then it leads right back into the next one because what I don't think that they've actually realized is that was never the goal yeah. in the first place. Yes. You know, the, the goal in the first place is the process, you yes. know, and the skill acquisition mm-hmm. that you're learning along that way, you know, with that, which is kind of fucked up when you really think yeah. it all through because those same people will be the ones that will have the identity issues when mm-hmm. it's taken away from them for mm-hmm. whatever reason. And they, because they've now attached that mm-hmm. to actually being what that, objective yes was yep when they've already kind of proven to themselves that was never the objective just because of how they felt after they finally achieved it Mm -hmm. you know which is interesting to sit there and just mind game yourself with oh yeah right because it's just round and around even just on that very topic like that is something that i went through in the 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 loss of the sport i was playing Mm -hmm. i had my car accident when i hurt my back and they said this is it the I was seeing a psychiatrist and psychologist at the time because it was, it was court mandated to kind of prove you know how severe things were, and I was going through a period of grief not because of my dad, but it was because everything that I had literally dedicated my entire life to achieving it was taken away in an instant, and the identity of who I was as a person, the focuses in my life, the relationships I had at the time, the the passions and the pursuits that I had was to this outcome that now it will never happen. Even if it didn't happen at the time, it was in my head, it was still something that was possible, right? Mm-hmm. Like it was something I could work towards and I might've got to 30 or 40 and it never panned out, but it was always a, a could be. And that was always something to guide me and train towards like life till 30 is about this. And at 21, it was, that's no more. That will never happen. It doesn't matter what you do or how you come back from this. You will never do this now. Mm-hmm. And that was a, a an experience of a grief that I couldn't even explain. Like I was genuinely grieving this loss of now what I'd learned after, you know, ironically studying these fields and these topics was my identity. It was who I was as a person was now gone. I had to try and figure out who I was beneath that goal. As you said, the the goal wasn't so much to get a contract to the professional level. It was I'm just someone who is innately drawn to growing, training, improving, self-development, physical development, pushing my limits and finding what I'm capable of. That can be done in any aspect or field. But as you said, you know, some people get that pro card or they don't get that pro card and then that's their identity gone. Their whole thing is caught up in, I have to be a pro athlete or I have to be a pro bodybuilder. It's like, okay, but very few people actually get that. Very few people actually reach that outcome. Very few people actually achieve that that signature on the card. So who are you as a person if you don't get that? Are you a worse person? Are you a better person? Because to me, subjectively and objectively, 
that sport pursuit should make you a better person regardless of where you end up, regardless of the contract you receive, regardless of winning that pro card or going to the pro level in any field. The endeavor by and large should make you a better individual or athlete or just a better person from the the skills, the traits, and the things that you have learned inside that pursuit. And that's what I think makes sports, makes bodybuilding so powerful when it's done for that reason beyond I just want a pro card. Like you said, we strip it back. Most people, the goal isn't the pro card. It's perhaps they've never had a direction in their life. They've never had a connection with people. They've never had a focus where they've wanted to achieve something. They've never understood sacrificing their entire being for something more. And so they give it all to bodybuilding. They give it all to powerlifting. They give it all to American football. Okay, but beneath that, you are someone better than just, I want to be an athlete. Yeah. So once you're able to get them on the same page mm -hmm. there, which easier said than done, <laughs> once you're yeah. able to get them on the same page, and then you're going to look at the end of their, help them to know what their values are. Mm -hmm. So what process do you use to unpack that? So when we, when we approach psychology, there's a lot of different schools of thought, uh, I guess, as to how you how you approach things. You know, it's, it's very similar to training where people are like, you know, I'm a GVT camp. I follow Mike Metzer and I'm doing low volume but high intensity. I'm following the high volume bodybuilding guys. Like, you know, there's always these different schools of thought or approach. And one of the things that I really am drawn to is what we call an existential uh, school of thought. And one of the one of the the actions that I'll take, one of the uh, the conversations I'll have, is I'll, math, I'll, I'll sit them down and usually have a conversation when we start, when we're getting going, I have them fill it out. I'm like, when you fill out your values, I want you to think about the day that you die, the day that your family is together and everyone is discussing you at your funeral. What are the three words that you would let, that would define your life said to you by your family or, or talked about by your family, by your friends? What would be written on your tombstone that would, if anyone else came back and looked at you in a hundred years time said this person was here these three words define them and a lot of the time that gets rid of all the bullshit gets rid of a lot of fluff and at the crux of people like oh these things and they'll connect that with you know it's because of that raw emotional power of it they're actually sitting and thinking at a deeper level than just oh i'm someone who's friendly and i'm cheery and i like to hang out with my friends like that's not values Give me the real answer. Like, how would you like to your life to be defined the day you die and everyone gathers around you? And with that conversation, the amount of people that, oh, actually, I need more than a week. Like, usually with our onboarding process, we've had the conversation. I will send them the spreadsheet. I'm like, I want this back from you. And a lot of the time, it's like, I can't do this in a week. I'm like, cool. Send me something so I know that you're actually working on it. But I want you to review this. And the reason why the goals, the values are so important from that approach when we when we list that out is if someone starts to deviate, if someone starts to fluctuate or I'm really trying to teach them something and you know maybe they've had a mess up on the weekend or maybe they've made a few mistakes in their week, they're not 100% focused. I will, instead of chastising and ripping into them and making them feel worse, I'm going to sit them down, whether it's a phone call, a message, text, whatever, an email. Usually we send uh, check-ins via Loom, a lot of coaching practice now. I'll say, okay, what you told me at the start of this, at the start of all of this, was you want to be here and we're here and you want to work on these things. Go back and review your values. Go back and review those three words that you said are going to be written on your tombstone and tell me are the actions that you're engaging in aligned with those values. How long does it take the average person to come up with what those three words are? They'll give me something in a week, usually two weeks, but they'll be reevaluated because what they think they've written, what they think they're about, what they think they want... You know, I have, this, I have this kind of belief, if you put uh, 20 men, a football team, you know, there's 11 players on an NFL field, there's 13 players on a rugby league field. If I put you guys all in a group and I asked you inside that group, what your goal is, what are your values? What do you want to do? Usually it's a very superficial goal. You're like, I want to win the championship or I want to the grand final. But then you take them out of that group setting, you isolate them and say that same thing. Tell me what it is you want out of life before you die. What is left behind? What have you achieved? And they'll have a much deeper deeper oh, emotional goal. There's something deeper that they want. And so it's that same sort of process. When I first have the conversation and we're trying to break down those walls, we're having those powerful conversations and I'm using these tools and strategies, I'll get something. I'm like, okay, I need you to go write that on paper. And I'll send it back. Yeah, I want to get on stage. Cool. There's something more there than that. Take some time and really think about this. And I want you to take time to actually sit and think about what your values are as a person. 
Because you ask most men, most athletes, besides the contract or the NFL or you know the NBA, most of them have never actually been asked what they truly want in life. Usually someone's told them, society's told them, there's pressures that have told them. They might say they want a contract, but how many kids in America are brought up by their parents to really drill home like you're playing football? You're in that camp now. This is what you're doing because that's going to help you get out of poverty or it's going to get you a scholarship, which is cool. That's great. But what do you actually want? No one's really sat down with a lot of people and had that conversation. So when we have that, that's what I try to give them in that, con- in that, in that context. What is it if everything went well? What do you want that to be? And then, you know, they'll get something back, which is great. It's a start. I'm like, okay, there's, there's deeper here. This is, this is a layer, but we can, we can add another. So I'm like, take some time, go away for a couple of weeks, you know, keep working on it. We're going to keep working in the process. We're going to still, I'm teaching you skills. I'm teaching you habits. Like I'm not rushing to prep people. I take the time to build the necessary skills, lifestyle factors, habits, systems that the prep is successful. So take some time while we're already working on these things. And in the next two weeks, I want you to come back with something even bigger. I want to come something real. And usually in that time frame, if they haven't got something the first time, there is a much deeper goal the second time around where they're almost in tears having that conversation. Well, what's what's interesting to me is shit now it's probably been over 20 years ago i had a business consultant i was working with and they were associated with the e-myth going way back and it was a four-year process but one of the first activities that i had to do was to define a primary aim Mm -hmm. right yes which is kind of the same thing that you're talking about with the tombstone and all that and it was hard yep right it was it it ended up taking four months to be mm-hmm. completely honest but because it would it would change yep. you know because you know it's like what do you live for like fuck i don't know you mm-hmm. know it, it's all over the place to be able to figure that out and then after a certain point in time of just this endless loop of things changing all the time of not really known and of what a company's primary aim would be which at the time it's it's mind because it was just yep. me right yep. but it it also had to apply to if it was more than just me mm-hmm. right and then she asked me to compile a list of my values mm-hmm. right and i'm like well what the fuck right mm-hmm. yeah and the way that i was navigated through that was to think back and write down five to ten people mm-hmm. throughout the course of my life that have made a statement at some point in time like defining moments mm-hmm. uh, at one point in time i my mom was late picking me up from wrestling practice and I'm never a a fish. I was getting beat all the time. I'm just running the stairs over and over and over and over because she was late. The coach came by and at probably 45 minutes, Mm -hmm. coach comes by and asked me what I'm doing. I'm like, I'm tired of fucking losing, you know, so I'm just going to keep doing this. He says, if you keep training harder than everybody else, you'll never lose. Mm -hmm. And that resonated. And I know his name and I know the statement. I can remember it vividly to this day, Mm -hmm. you know, so Bill Mullen, you know, there was a statement. So through the course of, you know, and it could be a cartoon, it could be a book character or a person, mm-hmm. movie character, whatever it was. So I have this list, you know, of 10, you know, people with whatever they said. And then the opposite of that was think of 10 instances or, that yeah. happened in my life that pissed me off. Yep. That was really hard to get over. Yeah. Right. And then do a Google search for core values and assign the core values yep. to it. And then from there were the similarities between all that. And then it was like, bam, there it is. Mm-hmm. Right. Because, you know, our core values are developed you know, as we age, Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe you can create new ones, but it's easier to lean into the ones that you already have. Yeah. And what that ended up being was actually pretty cool because, you know, it ended up being live, learn, pass on, but the core values are a little bit deeper than what that is. But anytime I've had to make any decision in my life Mm -hmm. and I'm not sure where to go, all I have to do is to look at that list Mm -hmm. and the answer is right there right? It's, mm-hmm. it's either a violation and these, these work on, they're not absolutes. They all work on standard deviations. Mm-hmm. You're going to fuck up plus yeah. or minus, you know, as long as you know what the home base is yep. from that. But then once that was done, then we wrote, where do you want this business to be in five years? Mm-hmm. Right. And then it's basically the same, all the same things that you're saying right here. Yeah. And then out of that statement or three paragraphs, we would go through there and we would highlight anything that was quantifiable. Mm-hmm. Like customer service should be this. Yep. I have no customer service. You know, it's, yep. it's just me. You know, I don't know how to rank it. Yep. So we just ranked it on a scale of one to five. Mm-hmm. And then those became key strategic indicators. Yep. You know, that kind of build out. And this grow defines the business. Business. So it just defines the whole, which those indicators would define somebody's progress. Mm-hmm. 
you know, are they moving toward or away from their goal based upon what that five-year plan is? Literally what you just described there is a skill that I teach my clients, uh, whether it be my gen pop clients, my athlete clients, my executive clients, and it's called a choice point. Mm -hmm. And again, the, the big activity first is finding your goals and finding your values. The reason why it's called a choice point is that every single decision we make as an athlete, as an individual, as a bodybuilder, a powerlifter, an executive, a CEO, it doesn't matter. There is a thousand decisions a day, micro or massive, that we make. And this tool is in any given situation like that, especially like when, when my clients are in prep, I need them to know this tool before we start prep because it becomes so useful. Is the decision I'm about to make going to take me towards the goals, values, and life that I've talked about that I say I want? Or is it going to take me away? Now, for the average person, it's it's not about a perfect day. It's not about you know every decision being towards. There's going to be times where those decisions just don't happen. It's about can I make the majority of these decisions better than uh, towards or away from where I want to go? And then that tool, we can start to even quantify and tangibly put a value to it. Where okay, how many of those decisions did you make today? Well, you know, a big thing for me is teaching uh, micro behavior skills before we get to prep. Are you hitting your vegetable targets, your health targets, your cardio targets, your fruit targets, your protein targets? Okay, if the majority of those are yes, but you got one that was away. You know, you went out with the the guys for a night and you got on the beers instead of having your protein shake. Cool. Next week, what are we going to do differently? It's going to take you towards that goal. It's going to take you towards those values because the, the objective is to live as much of your life towards those values and goals that you say define you and that you want to achieve. And then you really can't fail at life. At the end of the day, if, you're, if the decisions that you are making are towards the outcome, the values that you say that you, are, that you want, that define you as a person, then how can you say that you've had a, your life is wrong or bad? It's, everyone's a subjective, but arguably with that approach, you're now you have a tangible tool to use to work towards what you want. And it's, it's making decisions align with the values that you want to define you as a person. And I use that for my, like I said, I use that for my athletes, my preppers. I use that for my gen pop clients because it then it, it empowers them to make the decision and they can sit there and go, no, nah, you know what? Having 10 beers with my mates after work when I'm supposed to go train is stupid. So where would neutral fall, right? Because no decision is still a decision. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point. It is. And you know, that's a that's a it's a hard situation to navigate because even if they're, you know, again, I would say to me, if if someone was to say, my wife made the decision for me to go on here, or like, you know, I just didn't step up to the plate and confront my boss or make that decision to say no. Well, we look at your values. Is, is not answering or stepping up aligned with those values? Well, no. Okay, so that decision is still away. Yeah. That's where yeah. you start to look at it and go, okay, those decisions are still taking me away from because it's not just the it's not just the goal, right? The the overarching theme is, is this taking me towards the person I want to be? And that's when we strip that back and we strip back the athlete side, we strip back the identity side, we strip back the contract of the pro card, you know, whether you got a pro role, whatever it is that you're going to, we strip that back. Who are you as a person? Well, that same strategy applies. Are these decisions making me a better person or am I making the decisions that align with the type of person that I want to be? And then usually the type of person you want to be is someone who is athletically inclined. It is business inclined. It is you know, bodybuilding inclined. So they kind of follow the same, same path. So if part of those values are you're not, making a de you're not stepping up and making a decision, I'd still argue that's an away decision that's taking you away from the life that you want. Because you as a person should be confident and building that that inner belief and that self-confidence to say no that isn't for me that isn't what i want yeah. do you find that people typically want to jump ahead so if we, if we take the things that we've spoken about right now mm -hmm. and if you just follow that path you know that's going to lead to progression mm -hmm. towards x mm -hmm. right where x can be their whatever their purpose is mm -hmm. right where people will wreck themselves trying to figure out what their purpose is yep. where sometimes you may never mm -hmm discover what that is. Mm -hmm. But the only way you're going to be able to discover what that is, is for all those things to be moving mm -hmm. in that positive direction yep. for you to be able to, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. They're so wrapped around trying to figure the purpose yeah. out that they're not doing these core things yes. that will actually show them yes. what that purpose is. Yes. And that gets conflated when with information mm -hmm. online and all over the place oh, yeah, yeah. of 
find your purpose, find your purpose, find yep. your purpose, what's your passion, da, 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 yep. you know, and, you know, outside of religion, you know, mm-hmm. if, if my purpose is to live for Christ, right, mm-hmm. you know, then outside of religion, there's going to be this big blank. Yep. And then people are mind fucking themselves yes. because they're trying to figure out what it is. Mm-hmm. And it, to me, it doesn't matter mm-hmm. as long as all those things are moving in that direction. Yes. Based upon the values mm-hmm. and objectives, even if the objectives and goals are going to change, yep. the behaviors are still going to yes. be moving through. Exactly. So uh, a really easy example of this was just going back to um, yeah, my injury and kind of where I lost myself. The the big thing for me and why I, I preach bodybuilding so hard, but from a psychological perspective, the way it improves life, if it's done for the right reasons, is I can pinpoint the day that I truly identified what my purpose was and what I wanted to do with our company. I knew that there was, I was always wanting something bigger, but you know, as you said, you know, there's a, a blank. It was, it was going to be rugby league. It was going to be this contract that didn't happen. It was going to be doing this craft and this trade that didn't happen. But I always knew that there was something that I just, I wasn't comfortable with doing nothing. And when I really recognized like, what is my, what is my passion? What is the thing that I love doing? And it was, you know, when I broke it down, it's like, I love training, I love pushing myself. I love, you know, chasing something that's almost intangible. It's almost impossible. What's that? What's that thing that does that? And, you know, I've always had a big love for Arnie. It was like, you know, he was one of the first action heroes I ever saw. He was one of the first guys. I'm sure every, every bodybuilder that comes anywhere near a conversation like this will say Arnie. Um, it might be earlier than that, but, you know, usually it's Arnie. And I was like, I've always looked at that as something to strive towards. And once I started training and I started really getting back into training based on the, especially the fact the doctor said I couldn't, I was like, you know what? F you guys, this is what I'm about. This is what I'm going to do. You can't tell me I can't. I'm going to find, you know, I spent four years putting a list of exercises together that that didn't aggravate or hurt my problems. That didn't make the, the, the injury worse, but it didn't take care of them. So I'm like, I can still do that. And I put that list together. And so I'm like, I'm going to do this no matter what, especially because you said I can't. And it started off as that kind of like pride, that frustration, that, you know, um, almost a whole screw you mentality. But the funny part is when I started really pushing it and I started taking myself to that next level, getting through the hunger, getting through the physique pain, suffering, being lean, suffering, you know, energy depletion, looking at, you know, the cognitive depletion because the brain stops working, you push yourself through those things. And then suddenly I realized that this is what I wanted to do, not just compete, but I wanted to help people reach a level of life that I had thought was impossible, that I struggled to get to, that I may have never reached. Like I want to be the bridge for people that at a high performance level, they may never have got to, but it came because I started striving. I worked towards that next big thing and I started working towards that outcome that at the time, five years ago, when I started truly competing, I, I looked at being, you know, a hundred kilos on stage is impossible. Like, that's ridiculous. I was 70, 80 kilos overweight because I was so depressed. I was drinking, I was partying, you know, I was doing just, I was still training, but I just wasn't doing it as much as I knew I could, the whole identity loss. And the more that I committed myself to it, the more I engaged in those behaviors, the more I had my goals on paper, I had them tangible, I aligned my values with what I was trying to achieve, then the purpose started presenting itself. The thing that I really wanted that I've now built my entire life and belief around started to present itself like, this is what I'm going to do. I can pinpoint from here back five years ago, never in a million years am I expecting that I'm going to be on talking with you about mm-hmm. a podcast about this very concept. But the fact that I engaged, started, and continued, it just started presenting itself. And so that's a big thing for me is, uh, again, kind of like you said, we touched on before, is the purpose, it doesn't have to be written first. It doesn't have to be like you have to have everything clear, mapped out. But we have, to have, we have something, an objective, an aim that we're working towards, and then it's probably going to present itself. So eventually you'll know, and Dr. Jordan Peterson talked about this a lot, where he will say, you know, the, the moving forward, is better than not moving at all because then eventually you can see, is this for me? No. Well, now I can pivot. I can deviate. At least if you're moving forward in line with those values and those, those, those ideals of you as a person, you're going to find something that aligns with you, that you are passionate about, that you can contribute from, that you can give back with, that's going to make you a better person, have you feel fulfilled. That's a big thing that, that I try to preach is I don't want you to feel happy. I don't want you to feel great. I don't want you to feel good. I want to know that at the end of your time, and if I've been involved in this in some way, fantastic. But at the end of your time, when it's all done, do you feel fulfilled 
in the life that you left behind. And that to me, if I can give that to my athletes, my bodybuilders, my clients, my executives, like you can make money, but do you feel fulfilled about it? You can get on stage, but do you feel, feel fulfilled about that endeavor? And if you don't, like it's, it's, it's okay. You've strived towards, you've tried it, but can we pivot? Can we find that next thing? It might not be for you. That's cool. Powerlifting might not be for you. I once thought I was going to be a powerlifter. I loved the idea of just pushing a number and then my back happened. I'm like, okay, that's not for me. So I can be defeated about it. I can be upset about it. Or it's just not for me. What's the next thing that pushes me? What's that thing? And then you start to connect. Does that, that feeling of fulfillment come? Do I feel in the moment present? Are my values aligned with this behavior? Do I give back from this? Can I contribute value to society from this? If that doesn't define your purpose, I don't know what will. Well, the, the, here's the rub with all that because <laughs> this is real life, mm -hmm. right? So everything can be aligned. You can be doing mm -hmm. everything you're supposed to be mm -hmm. doing yes. and all that are going to be there and you're still not going to hit. Mm -hmm. you know, what you want to hit. Yes. You know, and that's just the reality of yes. all that. But some, and this will kind of probably get more into the, the resilience, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> some of it is a false perception. Yes. That is being over-exaggerated. Yes. To where sometimes you got to go back to go forward. Sometimes mm -hmm. you got to fail to move, you know, to, mm -hmm. to succeed. And, but that first sense of, you know, I didn't hit this quarterly number. Mm -hmm or whatever it's going to be, or I didn't hit the quarterly number for eight quarters, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't mean you're not going to hit it on the night. Yes. But over a period, of, I mean, it could be, yes. and it could be that a pivot needs to happen, but mm -hmm. you're so stubborn, yep. you won't make the pivot. Yes. So there, there's two types of people that kind of yes. fall in there. There's the one that sense that little bit of resi resilience mm -hmm. and then boom, they're done. This isn't for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, and fine. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, cause maybe they need that and they're, that's what's stopping them from everything that they're doing. Yes. You know, it's, it's in powerlifting. I'll use the example of, you know, is if somebody's starting, they have to learn how to strain. Mm -hmm. Right. And with a lot of lifters, as soon as they sense the bar slowing down, it's heavy. Mm -hmm. Shit, I'm done. Yeah. Right. Or discomfort, I'm done. Yeah. Then the more that they strain and learn how to strain, mm -hmm. they learn that if they just keep pushing, it will go. Yes but it takes the repetition to be able to do that. <laughs> Some people can take that and just say, this isn't for me, mm -hmm. right? They're mm -hmm. done, but all they had to do was push for another second mm -hmm. and then it would have went through, Yes, you know? And, and so there's, when you're dealing with trying to teach and not teach, but build, because mm -hmm. everybody has it, Yes, right? Everybody has resilience, right? Mm -hmm. It's as I said before, everybody has all these attributes. Yes, They're just not connecting them to mm -hmm. the things that they want to do. Yes. And, how do you go about building that? So a big thing for me, um, and this will probably conflict with a lot of coaches that listen to this or people that think the opposite of what I'm about to say is I actually spend most of my time talking clients off competing. What I do first is approach a kind of exposure for a lack of better word. Before I go putting you in the deep end of the, the negatives and the positives that can come from on stage competitive bodybuilding, I want to see if you have, or we can teach or build those traits and skills first. So I'm a big believer in exposing the client, especially if they're first or second time competitors where, you know, they haven't actually really truly experienced being lean before. They haven't experienced being hungry. And like you said, they haven't experienced the strain. I agree wholeheartedly that teaching failure and hard training is a skill. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't understand that skill. And so a big thing for me is I will expose them to these gradual concepts over time, especially because I will approach it, you know, 12 months, two years before we get on stage. You know, it's counter to my business advisors, you know, how to make money, you know, mm -hmm. put people through preps. That's great. That's cool. But that's not how I, the philosophy of how I coach. It's not a philosophy of how I build what we're building in bodybuilding, in physique development. So a big thing for me is I'll, I'll try and talk down a client that comes in, you know, they're gun swinging, they're, you know, screaming from the rooftop, like, I'm going to be a pro. I want to do this. I'm like, I used to fall for that. I've had this conversation a lot this week while being in America. I used to fall for that a lot. I was hyped that clients would come in and they're, you know, I'm, I'm going to be this and I want to do that. And for you, I want to, I won't stop. I'm like, cool. And then I would see the behaviors didn't align with that. And they were all talking. It was like, that's cool. So now we try and take that step back. We, we deconstruct them. Like, all right, let's expose you to what bodybuilding could be before you even get near a stage. And a big thing in Australia at the moment is like photo shoot content or like, you know, getting lean for a photo shoot or getting lean for a beach shoot or a gym shoot. Um, you know, it might just be, whether it's be for social media content, whether it be for your business, whatever it might be. And so something along those lines, the really easy tool to give someone a taste of 
this is what bodybuilding is kind of like. But if we look at tangibly photo shoot conditioning versus stage winning conditioning, it's another three or four degrees of difficulty away. It's six or eight more weeks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it's like we use that sort of that that sort of uh, scaffold or template to say, let's find something similar to the goal you're trying to achieve. That you know, we know it's extreme. I preach extreme goals. I love people saying like, I want to do this impossible thing. Cool. Let's do that because a lot of the time people come in with these superficial goals and they don't really say what they mean. So I love if someone comes in and says to me like, Hey, we're gonna. I want to do this big thing. Fantastic. Let's write that down. But we're gonna start with building these exposures. I'm going to get you exposed to being hungry on a diet. I'm going to get you exposed to being in a surplus where you're uncomfortable, you're fatter, you know, you're having to force feed yourself. I'm going to expose you to having to do cardio. Some things that you might not have done before to the same degree. And then we're going to say, you know what, instead of getting on stage with a tan in front of a thousand people and you're going to be judged on your weakest body parts and you're unsure if you can even handle that, we're going to do a photo shoot. Or we'll do, you know, we're going to get you in front of a camera. We're going to get you lean enough to feel confident for a shirtless photo. Maybe some, maybe some content for your social media. Whatever. Doesn't even need to go into it. Maybe it's just for your partner. Maybe it's for your husband or your wife. Like you know, some boudoir photos or something like that, where you feel, you know, confident. I feel good naked. Because a lot of men, a lot of men especially, there's been a long time since they felt comfortable enough to be naked in front of their wife and you know have sex with a light on. So maybe that's what we work towards. It's still going to take the same skills, the same approach, but it's not going to be as extreme. Now, if we get to that photo shoot and you're like, man, that sucked. Well, I got news for you about how bodybuilding is going to go. Because if you don't enjoy every aspect of that, like you're not going to enjoy being hungry, but if you want embracing the suck, if you want embracing that hunger, that, that, that suffering, that training strain, that lack of recoverability from just doing a photo shoot, I promise you, you're not enjoying bodybuilding. No. So at least with that approach, we can say, okay, you tried it. You tried it. We had a crack. It's not for you. What's the next thing we want? You know, I, I had a, a client of mine now who's uh, been with me since almost the start. He was one of my first prep clients. And he come to me and he said, I want to be a bodybuilder. I want to be a physique athlete. I want to be a physique competitor. So like men's board, like men's physique, whether board shorts. He's like, I want to do that. I'm like, cool, man. And I was pushing him towards it, pushing him towards it. I was in his corner. His body was resistant. His life wasn't set up for it. You know, this was before I really had the, the systems in place to screen these things. And I had this conversation with him. He was also a pilot. And he was loving being a pilot. Like it was his, like when we actually really got sitting down and talking, he'd become a very close friend to me actually. And, you know, we got talking about his family life, his relationships, his career ambitions. And now what we, what we realized was he, the physique side of things, it was great in theory. We now have him in the Australian Defense Force training towards what we call the Advanced Fighter Pilot Program. So, uh, for us in Australia, you basically have to go through, do your baseline credentials, your baseline training, get accepted into that, get accepted into the pilot program, so the Australian Air Force. And then you know, we, we, as far as my knowledge on the topic, we purchased a lot of things from you guys, especially things like F-18s, um, F-35s, like they cost us a lot of money. So we're, I believe we're very strict on like, you know, who gets behind those. Yeah. And so there's a program. Called- you should be. Yeah, which you should be, <laughs> they're right? Like, expensive they're expensive out. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's a $300 million <laughs> aircraft. Let's not just put Greg behind it. <laughs> so for us, it's like there's a big uh, program to kind of get you there. And he was like, I actually want to do this. I was like, man, why didn't you tell me that six months ago, 12 months ago? Well, you may not have known. Exactly. Yeah. Like he, know, he knew that he wanted, to fly, like, he wanted to fly. He was a pilot by trade, but it was like commercial and uh, uh, flight school. He taught flight school. But we sat down and he was like, Man, I want to give back to my country. I want to operate at this level. We started training him for the uh, what we call the the. Uh, bear with me here. Our really uh, SASR. Uh, so basically, our special operations, and we started training him up for that because, in our logic, if he could handle the the elite special forces of Australia's training, then the pilot program, it's not weak by any means. But it's kind of a step back. And so we're like, okay, so he loved training. He loved the consistency. He loved the dedication, the focus. But the val- it just wasn't who he was. He wasn't going to be a physique competitor. And I was like, cool, we tried it out. We gave it a crack. You've had several cracks, actually. Life got in the way every time. Like, do you really want this? And for me as a coach, I think that's my responsibility. I, I would feel ethically and morally wrong to put someone on stage and force them to be on stage because I want them to, not because they want to be there. Because it can mess your life up. Oh yeah, it can. Like I've known pros. I've talked with pros. I've engaged with people where, even at the highest level, they're on breaking point. Life is, you know, teetering 
on the is this worth it kind of direction. And so the average amateur, I would feel not only have I done a disservice as a coach, but as a, as a person, as who I am as a person, I have failed you by trying to force you to be on stage because you didn't want to be. Mm -hmm. And so we had that conversation. I was like, I will coach you through this. Like, you know how to train. You're driven to be athletic. You're driven to be consistent. So the side that really he needed help on was the psychological side, the mental side, the, the skill set side in that regard. Because at that level, again, those resilience, the fortitude, the not giving up, those skills kick in when it comes to that type of training. A lot of the training, most guys, you know, you read any book on elite special forces operations, the guys that come in cocky and arrogant, they fall first. So my job with him was, let's get you away from this. That's not what you want. And that's okay. That's perfectly okay. We gave it a crack. And I've identified this is not working out. We were 12 weeks out from a show, I believe, and his body fat loss just dropped. It just stopped. It's, there was plateaus. Nothing was moving. His food was coming down. Supplementation was coming down. Drugs were coming down, uh, going up. And there was just no shift in his body fat and his weight. And like, we had this conversation. I was like, your life is just not set up to do this. What I'm about to do to you is going to be hell. Do you actually want to go through with it? And it's not as a sense of like an escape or an excuse to justify quitting, but it was if what I'm about to do to you is, you know, I've been through very deep diets to get on stage. If you're not set up for this, it will ruin you. Are you sure you want this? And we had the conversation. He said, no. And I was like, well, what do you want to do? Let's have that conversation. Because I'll coach you. And he's like, I want to get into the fight pilot program. He's like, I, <laughs> I fly. I'm like, that's cool. But I want to be an elite fighter pilot. Fantastic. Where is he right now? He's literally in those schools. He's now doing the simulations. He's working his way up to, he's doing flights now. So he's not in there yet, but it's, and that's, it's again, such an arduous process. It's a long process and strive to get that. But we made that pivot. We assessed it and said, you know what? It's not for you. Well, we use the criteria. We use the kind of the skills and the traits and these, these topics we've talked about and say, you know what, man, it's probably not for you, but that's okay. Because you still want to pursue something what I would deem high performance. Being an elite fighter pilot is pretty high performance. So I know that you're someone who wants to push yourself. Let's pivot. Let's take the skills you've learned from bodybuilding, from training. You know how to train to fail. You know how to push yourself. Guess what you're going to have to do over here? We know how to sacrifice. You're going to have to lose time with your family. You've already done that over here. Let's do it over here. Are you okay with those things? Yeah. And he has not complained once. He'll call me, basically paying me to be on retainer to call him through the mental problems. He's basically paying me to say, I need help here. What do I do? The training's taken care of. That's easy. He knows how to do that. The thing that I'm really coaching him for, that I'm really getting a result from him for, is basically being there to say, hey, this is how you use this tool. Let's try this strategy. Figure this out. I didn't build, uh, to go on a little bit of a tangent, I had him build a replica setup in his living room because they got, kind of all got put on base. In his living domain, a fighter pilot cockpit. I'm like, one of the things he was struggling with was the, the procedure of operations, the strategy, uh, kind of how to operate each sort of like flight sequence and things like that. I was like, mock this up so you are there. So you're associating the smells, the sights, the sounds, the, the, the setup. So that when you're in that room, when you're in that, 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 that pit and you're flying, it's just second nature. You've done it. You've done it a million times. You know what it feels like. You know what it looks like. You know what it's set up like. And that was like this, a single skill like that changed his entire approach. But the point being to go back to it was we started with bodybuilding and he said, we said, that's not for me. And now we're literally training him to be a fighter pilot. So when you're dealing with, with, with the resilience example that you, examples that you gave me, a mini cut, for instance, or mm -hmm. bulking, mm -hmm. they're, they're all physical related, mm -hmm. right? So, and that's, can teach those skills, mm -hmm. you know, but the real resilience is going to come from the mental side, mm -hmm. you know, and th because they're in their head all day long, yes. they're only in the gym an hour a yes. day. You know, maybe, maybe every day, but most likely yes. not, you know, so it's not in there, but mm -hmm. they still have to live within their own head, you know, throughout that whole time mm -hmm. to where there's always resistance yes. there, mm -hmm. you know, self-talk, negative mm -hmm. talk, you know, social groups, you know, influence, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, from everywhere, yep. you know, positive and negative. Mm -hmm. So how do you help them to build the resilience there? Because that's going to have a greater impact mm -hmm. than the resilience they're going to have from those certain situations there oh yeah 100 percent. so uh a big thing for me is i we wrote an ebook on this um i just i just live to give away information um it's how to build your optimal environment and one of the things i talk about is 
if you really want to push yourself, you're going to see what you're capable of. Assess your social circle and change it. Set goals and set boundaries with your social circles. And if you really want to push yourself mentally to see if you're focused, if you can handle it, watch the friends that push back. Because a lot of the time you change, for lack of a better word, you set a goal, you try to be different, you try to step up. The, the, the circle that you're associated with, the circle that you are surrounding yourself with, they only want you to be so much better because eventually it puts it on them that, hey, I'm not changing. And now this guy's stepping up and he's you know doing something different. He's an outlier to what he used to be. You know, We used to go out for beers and now he's not coming. And if you really want to get resilient at building that, like building those mental skills, tell your friends that you've known for 20 years, 10 years, that you don't do that anymore. And they will push those boundaries very quickly. And I, I'm a big believer of you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. If you genuinely believe this is what you want to do, one of the first things I do is have my clients assess that social circle. Not to get, not because not every person's wrong, not every person's a bad person, but assess that social circle and ask yourself, how many people in this room want to see me succeed when I've just told them this new goal? When I've just told them this big dream that I have and I'm going to work towards? I arguably have changed my social circle five, six times in the last 10 years. The people that I surrounded myself with when I first had my car accident, it was all about drinking. It was always like, oh, you know, you can't play anymore. So you may as well come to the, to the, to the hill and drink beers, you know, pregame, things like that. And don't get me wrong, that was their thing. They loved, that was their, their weekend hobby. But I was an athlete first before I was a spectator or a coach. I'm like, that's not how I approach my rehab. Like, that's not going to get me better. It's not going to beat my depression. Drinking and alcohol and drugs makes a depression tenfold worse. So we expose that situation. I have, I have clients assess those social circles. I have clients have hard conversations with family members. Before we start a prep, we're going to sit down with your wife or your husband and say, hey, this is what this is going to look like. Because that conversation gets real tough real quick when that person's like, hey, you know what? I sold you a bit of a lie about bodybuilding. It's not just training. I'm going to miss family events. I'm going to miss drinking. I'm going to miss going out. I'm going to miss weddings. I'm not going to miss doing things with the family. And it's not to say that you know, you're a selfish SOB, but it's a selfish endeavor. So exposing those conversations is a really powerful way to just just start with the idea of building that mental resilience, building that fortitude first. Because if you can say no to friends that you've known for 20 years, like you're on your way to building something. And it's not, again, it's not that the friends are wrong, but who you're trying to become now is different to who you were 10 years ago. And so you have to be comfortable having those tough conversations. And the best way to get comfortable having them is doing them. Be in that room and say, you know what? Lay it out with your friends. Um, get on a platform in six months. I want a 300 kilo deadlift or squat. I want to be 3% body fat. That doesn't leave me the room to have beer and wine at dinner or untracked food or you know, slip on my meal plan. I've got to be dialed in. And you'll see a lot of people say yes up front, but those, those boundaries start to get pushed very quickly. Oh, you can come out for one. Oh, two isn't going to hurt. Oh, you know, you used to come out for pizza and beers. Like, sure, you can have one slice. Anyone that's been to a decent level of condition knows that if you add that one slice, that changes everything. Yeah. I would add to that their, their digital circles as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right? Because they're probably around that more than they're around their friends. Mm -hmm. Right? So their, their, their digital influence, mm -hmm. you know, via social media or whatever it's going to be. Mm -hmm. and, and it could just be what you're actually watching, what you're doing. Yeah. You know, if it's TV, what you're actually watching, mm -hmm. what you're doing. And that's not to say that you can't watch TV, yep. you know, but if you're watching eight hours a day, yeah. you know, that's different than if you're watching two hours a day, but you're yep. reading three hours a day or whatever it's going to yeah. be. Um, and with the social media, you can either be looking for the drama Yep. which we all tend to want to see yes. first, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I don't know if that's biological or what yeah. it is, <laughs> but being able to pivot away from that, you yes. know, and, and looking for things that are going to actually help support the movie. I just had this conversation with somebody while I was sitting down for lunch, literally <laughs> it was, you know, kind of about that, but it was, it was, it was dialed back a little bit more than what we're talking about here. It was more just around training mm -hmm. and it was, you know, if, if it's a bodybuilder prepping for a show or a power lifter and now they're whatever that time period is where they go into prep mode, which mm -hmm. is still weird for me to hear because I'm old. I mean, yeah. there was, it used to just be your bodybuilder. You yeah. There was no prep mode yeah. or prep time. But when that comes in, all your influence, if, if this is the way you're going to train and this is the way you're going to diet, everything about training a diet needs to be ignored. Mm hmm right? Because the focus just has to be on what that plan is from mm -hmm. here to here. Or if you find something interesting, you bookmark it, you save it, but you're not 
delving into it yep. because you do that, you're going to want to change what you're doing. You're going to yes. doubt what you're doing. And it's going to create those situations yes. in there where you got to be committed to what that is, which is kind of changing that digital, you know, during that time period.